Um, I have nothing prepared as an introduction for Lloyd Robertson. Um, because I just think it's nearly an impossible task. And in the time that I have known Lloyd, um, both as a viewer for many years and uh, later working for him at CTV News, I have learned that he covets brevity almost as much as he covets integrity and truth. So let me simply say he is one of the most accomplished journalists and anchorman in North America. He is the voice of integrity and truth and authenticity, not only for generations of journalists, but generations of Canadians. He is the voice. He is the master. He is Lloyd Robertson. Come have a seat. Hello. I have so been looking forward That's to this. It's a big crowd. Uh, it is a big Thank crowd. You. It's sold out. Congratulations. Thank you. I'd expect nothing less. Thank you all. Um, this is such a terrific book, and, and you know, we were talking uh, about brevity before, and you're, I mean, you're used to writing in a certain style, I mean, and, and I've, I've learned in my short year now at, no. at CTV National News that, I mean, when I was on Canada AM, you had four minutes for an interview, now you've got a minute 50, right. a minute 50 to, tell, to get all the voices, to bring it all in, and it means that the words that you choose, the wordsmithing is incredible, but... You had, to, you had to change your style of writing altogether with this. Well, what happened? Uh, where is Jim Gifford? Is he here? I know he's here. Jim, he's here. would you stand up? Stand up. Jim oh, Gifford Jim. is my editor. Where is he? Jim. Way back there. Jim Gifford, Harper Collins, my editor. And it was Jim on this very point, very early on, because I was used to, you know, cutting things back, trimming down all the time. And uh, Jim kept saying, give me more, give me more, give me more. And uh, when the first challenge came, uh, he said between 75 and 100,000 words, I thought, that's the Bible, for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> How am I ever going to do that? That was, that was uh, certainly one of the challenges. But once, uh, once you get into the flow, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't too difficult. Once I began to understand what I was doing, uh, and that took a couple of months, certainly. And then there was the other challenge, Seamus, which uh, some of my friends who have been in the business a long time, uh, have had, uh, you know, two or three wives, uh, other problems, right? Uh, so I wondered whether I could write a book that was going to be interesting enough. Uh, for example, my friend Harvey Kirk, and he would be the first one, were he here tonight, to admit this, he had three wives and two drunk driving charges. <laughs> I've, had, I've had one wife for 55 years and a couple of... S <laughs> Thank you. And a couple of speeding tickets. So how was I ever going to make the book interesting? I promise you it is interesting, yes. nevertheless. Right. Uh, the, the other thing about it, too, was um, having been uh, observing the parade all of those years, but never being in the parade uh, was a challenge because I had to literally kind of turn myself inside out because um, I always thought I wouldn't want particularly to do a book about myself. Yeah. I, I've been doing what you might call books and stories about other people for years and years. So how would I do one about myself? So what, uh, what you have to do, as I discovered very quickly, is look at yourself as the story. And when I was able to do that, when I was able to turn it around to uh, that position, uh, it was much easier for me, and at that point it began to flow. But I also came from an era, Seamus, where... Um, in the 50s, late 40s, where, you know, you weren't supposed to talk about yourself. Uh, it was rude. It was impolite to, to talk about yourself. Uh, you were supposed to uh, know your place and um, that's be what seen your and not heard. Used to say to that's you right. That's what my mother used to say. Know your place. Uh, don't get too big for your britches. Be seen, not heard. All of that. So uh, it took a bit of doing to come out of that phase, too, to get into a situation where I didn't feel self-conscious or embarrassed about talking about myself, and I could begin to look at it, uh, indeed, as a story. And when you, and the story begins, you're, you are extraordinarily candid about your mother. And, uh, and, and for a lot of people I know who have read this memoir, that's something that really, really struck them. Uh, and not only, you know, the fact that this was the household in which you were brought up, uh, you know, with a father who was ailing and was older, and with a mother uh, who went on and, and had a lobotomy um, and was intermittent in your life, um, but you're just very 
open in, in talking about it, which I think is commendable. Well, this is a decision you have to make quite early on, too. And my, my old buddy, Craig Oliver, who's mentioned a couple of times in the book, because <laughs> we're old chums, we go way back. Uh, he had um, a similar kind of upbringing, not the same circumstances, but he was bounced around, neighbors, uh, foster brothers, homes. foster homes, right? And uh, same with me. So he said early on, uh, when, when I was first considering writing the book, he said, you've got to be candid, because people... People will read a book about you, about the stories you've covered and so forth, but what they really want to know is who is this guy? Who is this guy who's been sitting there every night for 41 years between CBC and CTV? Did he have any challenges? Did he have any problems? Uh, you know, somebody, somebody I was dealing with in, uh, in Winnipeg, or in uh, Halifax rather, said to me, you know, we always thought you were one of those guys who went to private school with the crest on the pocket and all that kind of thing. It wasn't like that for me at all. I had a very difficult uh, beginning because my mother had several things wrong with her. She was what we would call bipolar, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, paranoia with, a, I'm sure, a touch of schizophrenia. So it was a very scattered relationship with my mother all through those early years. And then when I was 14 years old, she had a lobotomy. Now my father, he was 60 years old when I was born. So at that point, uh, sh shortly after I was born, he began to have various physical ailments uh, over overcame him. So uh, that's why I was shunted around, because my mother was in the hospital, my father was too ill to look after me. So in those early years, it was neighbors and and I had a lot of half-brothers and half-sisters because my father had eight children from his first marriage and then my brother and myself from the second marriage, and I am the last of the litter, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, so it, was, it was a difficult time at the beginning. And, and the other thing which, which um, people uh, find hard to realize now is how really difficult it was to have a mentally ill person in your home in those days. I mean, you think the stigma is strong now? Try 60 years ago. You couldn't talk about this person being there. Uh, you certainly couldn't invite your friends around. I mean, I, I would go to my friends' houses, and uh, they would occasionally ask very gently and discreetly about, you know, how's your home life, your mother, et cetera. And when I wouldn't talk about it, they then sensed, because kids get, get wise to it pretty quickly, that there was something seriously wrong. So they never asked to come around, and I always went out. So my mother, um, and in those years too, uh, you have to remember that mentally ill people were kind of non-persons. I mean, you, they could be experimented upon, um, as happened in Canada all those years ago in Ottawa. And um, certainly, you, you know, you, you, couldn't, uh, you, couldn't know, you couldn't let people know you had a mentally ill person in your house. Uh, you could talk about the crazy aunt in the attic or the, the crazy grandmother in the basement, but uh, you know that was, that was the total extent of, of the way you would deal with this problem. So I learned how to, how to shut that part of my life down uh, very quickly, and I think the reason I got into broadcasting is because I listened to the radio a lot when I was a kid, uh, as a lonesome kid at home uh, with a dreary home life. I listened to the radio all the time, and that, that took me into the world of the imagination. And I think that's really why I got into broadcasting, because there was this wonderful world out there that I could inhabit and really enjoy and be a part of and be lifted away from the dreariness of home. So I, as I, I was writing the book, I thought, this is why I got into broadcasting. Yeah. I, I didn't know it at the time, but, but I'm sure that's why. You also talked about how you and kids do this too, uh, they develop a shell that they carry on with them through life. That's right. Or they, you know, you protect yourself, you put on a picture for everybody that everything's perfect, and it's not. And it can stunt you emotionally. Oh yes, and it did stunt me emotionally. Uh, when I was uh, first married, uh, uh, Nancy and I, as I said, 55 years, it's been a wonderful, a wonderful relationship. But uh, it was very difficult for her at the beginning because I, I always had the shield up to protect me from emotional wounds, because in my case at home, uh, I was very fearful that my father was going to die quickly, and I had no relationship uh, that I could speak of with my mother, so I, was always, I always had the shield up to protect myself. And I carried that with me uh, into, my, into my early years, and it took me a long time before I could have real emotional exchanges with people, uh, with my wife, with my kids, 
You know, I could always pull back into the shell and act as though everything was fine yeah. because that's the way I behaved when I was young. And I got an ulcer, a very severe ulcer, as a result of that because I was carrying everything inside, not letting it come out. Yeah. Let's, uh, let me ask you about what, I'm sure you get to ask this question a lot, and, and there's a great chapter, by the way, in this book where you basically interview yourself and, <laughs> and, and ask the questions to yourself that you often frequently get asked and then you answer them. But let me ask you about what your big break was. Well, I guess the big break was uh, when, I, uh, when I decided to come to Toronto to uh, do an audition for the CBC all those years ago. I was working in Guelph, and there was a, uh, a broadcaster there by the name of Peter Griffin. Uh, some of you may remember the show Pete and Geets uh, on Chum years ago, other, other rock stations in Toronto. He was a great broadcaster. And he used to call me Lloydo, and he'd say, Lloydo, you know, you've got the pipes. You should be working for the CBC. And the CBC in those days was, was really beginning to grow and develop um, in radio. And then, of course, television was coming on stream. So it was becoming a big national organization. And uh, I wasn't sure I was ready for it, but nevertheless, I came to Toronto and, uh, and took the audition. There is a little story in here, which, uh, which I thought I, I mentioned to Seamus. Is this Jarvis Street? Yeah, it's the Jarvis Street story. <laughs> you know about the story Jarvis Street in the, those years, folks? No. I'm sure. I'm sh no? I don't think some things uh -huh. have changed. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, what happened was I, I was challenged to come down and take the audition. So I made the appointment. And I was, um, I took the bus actually from, uh, from uh, Guelph to Toronto Page because, um, because you know, I just didn't have the money uh, to, to uh, have a car or any, of, any of means of transportation. So took the bus down, uh, walked from Bay Street over to Jarvis, and then um, made my way up Jarvis Street to the CBC, which was housed in those days in an old ramshackle, old girls' school called, uh, I think it was the original, maybe the original Branksom Hall. In any case, it was not a very imposing presence for a national broadcaster. <laughs> but as I was making my way up Jarvis Street, and I'll read you this little chapter, <laughs> or a paragraph, it was only my second or third visit to the city, and on this occasion, since I had to walk the three or four blocks from the bus depot to the CBC headquarters on the storied Jarvis Street, Toronto was new to me. I saw everything in a new light. It was not just big, it was big and exciting, with a rhythmic hustle and bustle and a cornucopia of visual delights and exotic enterprise. While I considered myself somewhat worldly, despite not having been outside small-town Ontario, I was taken aback by the brazen nature of my first encounter with one of the city's working girls. <laughs> Walking up Jarvis Street to my appointment in the middle of the afternoon, I was approached by a perky, attractive brunette who was wearing a tight, low-cut sweater that displayed her ample attributes and jeans she had been poured into. She offered a variety of sexual services on a graduated economic scale <laughs> and seemed willing to bargain because I looked like, quote, a nice guy. Aware of the importance of my appointment and imagining the echoes of my father's voice warning of the perils of loose women, I stammered something about not being able to participate right then, but might see her on the way back. <laughs> it was a dodge she recognized, but it was very pleasant and told me to be sure to let her know about my important business of the day when I got back. Well, I didn't run into her again. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> That's one of the little lessons that, uh, when, when I'm doing some excerpts from the book, I tell people there are several little things you learn as you go through your journalism career. And on that one, it is when you have important business to conduct, stay focused. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> You talk about, uh, and it's very interesting because the epilogue of the book deals with your thoughts on, um, on how journalism is changing in, in this digital age and, and with new platforms. We'll get to that in a second. But you, because you, you were there at the, at the CBC when it was turning into a, a visual, the news was turning visual. I mean, at, yes. up until that point, it was just kind of moving radio. You were there when people started to understand how different it would be. Mm. Well, um, news changed dramatically uh, after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Because on that day, and I can recall being hauled into the, from the canteen into the announce booth at the CBC, and I read a, a bulletin initially 
uh, indicating that the president had been shot at Dealey Plaza in Dallas. And then after what seemed like an interminable wait, then came that awful bulletin which was being flashed around the world and which I had to read as well. And I, I now imagine everybody clued to the radio and the television sets, wherever they were, hearing that John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States, had been assassinated in Dallas at 1230 local time that day. And that changed everything in the television broadcasting world. Because up to that time, television was a not very reliable partner to radio and newspapers because it was so cumbersome to do television news back in those days. Uh, it was uh, what Walter Cronkite described in the early days as the 10-ton pencil, because you had to go out, you'd, you'd go out, take the, take the camera out, you had to edit, get the film back, get it processed, get it edited, get it on air. Uh, and uh, it, was too, it was too expensive for uh, most uh, organizations in, in the U.S. and Canada, so they didn't pay much attention to television news. But after that, during the Kennedy assassination, it was discovered the power of this incredible medium. And that launched what we now describe and have described for many years as the television age. Because this was a vehicle that could bring emotion and drama right into your living room and you could live it with, those, with the, the characters on the screen. And uh, we all remember, those, those of us who are around, will remember those images. The, the blood-stained dress of Jackie Kennedy, little John Jr. saluting the casket as uh, the hearse went by uh, that uh, terrible afternoon. And uh, what it did for TV was make it the gathering place for all future big events, including the Stanley Cup, uh, election nights, conventions, the moon landing. All of those things became television events, and that was the dawning of the television age. It also changed the way that newscasters were regarded, because Walter Cronkite, uh, that day, those of you who have seen that bit of video where he has his glasses on as he's reading the yeah. bulletin, and then he takes them off, and he pauses for a moment, and there was that little emotional catch in his throat, which you could hear, and then he continued on in thoroughly engaging commentary for another few days, uh, and I mean few days, because that, uh, that story lasted about four days, uh, and he was there practically the whole time. And that changed uh, uh, the definition of what he was doing from a newscaster to an anchor. Yeah. Now, most people think of that as being, you know, the, oh, well, that's like the anchor. He sits there, he does the news, the dead weight that drags at the bottom of the sea. No, it, uh, it, it isn't that. It was, it was coined by uh, the producer of 60 Minutes and Don Hewitt. And Don Hewitt decided that uh, Walter Cronkite, uh, the way he was doing it and the way others would come to do it, would be, he would be the head of the relay team. Uh, he would be the person people handed off to, and then he would take the information, edit, edit it down, distill it, put it in context, and then push it forward to the next person uh, to add more, the next level, to, to the story. So that really did change newscasting, anchoring, television, changed the game for television, everything. 1963 to 1965 right in that window. Uh, now, we all thought radio might be dead, but of course radio just adapted itself to the more mobile audience and became very portable. Um, kid, kids at the beach in the nascent rock era, they were able to make use of, of, uh, of the radios. But television, uh, the television age really began during that period. And, uh, and news, of course, just mushroomed after that.